Well, good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I have to admit, I am thrilled. I've been looking forward to this presentation. I had mountains of papers and books all over my desk, and then I looked at my time limit and thought, you've got to cut some things. <laughs> so I've been judiciously editing my comments, hoping to find just the right things to inspire your work today. Now, today's going to be really important. This is a room full of people who believe in excellence and student success, and that makes me very excited to be here. And the things that I hope to bring to you probably won't be very new, given the fact that you believe in excellence and student success. But I hope they'll at least refresh you a bit for the conversations that you'll have, and we'll give you some things to think about as you go from session to session and talk informally about how we can help our students learn and achieve here at K-State. As I was working on this, I came to one phrase that kept coming around again and again as I was working on the presentation, and it was this. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I think we can agree that for generations, teachers have wondered about their students and have recognized generational differences. So I didn't want my comments today to be negative. I didn't want them to be about one of those gosh darn students. I wanted them to more focus on what we can do to recognize those things that we know are different about our students and to find ways to improve our practice in working with them. So I know that my comments today are heavily weighted upon the traditional age, undergraduate, um, domestic student. Yet I know that there are some important student groups that can't be ignored. For example, our growing international student population, a very important group that should be part of our conversation today. Our veterans, non-traditional students, distance education students, our students who are coming back maybe to retool or repurpose for a different career and also students who are swirling. And that's kind of a new term that's out there for the students who are enrolling in multiple institutions at the same time. Maybe for convenience, maybe for economic reasons, but they're finding that they need to piece together their education by being in different institutions all at the same time, which makes them very interesting to serve and very interesting to track for reporting purposes. All of these are important demographics, but I wanted to make that disclaimer about my comments today. And I didn't want to stereotype. I wanted to talk about my personal observations and reflections and provide you with a bit of data, some of it national, some of it K-State specific. So I hope that this is useful. Now imagine that we were out walking on campus on maybe a bit of a warmer day than we've been experiencing lately. Some of the things that we might notice, go in the right direction here, would be students plugged into their earbuds, uh, getting jazzed up on some energy drinks, different than when I was in school. Uh, practicing a lot of tech use of technology through handheld devices, connected to the web even. And this is the one that interests me the most. For those of you in the back, I hope you can see flip-flops, once only beach attire, now everyday attire, and sometimes even for formal occasions and cold weather. I don't understand, but it is yet a trend. I wanted to provide you with some numbers to show how our, our campus is changing in terms of enrollment. I chose 1993, and you might be asking yourself why. I liked that number because it showed an, enough distance that you might be able to recognize change and trends. It's also the year that I came to K-State. And I toyed with the idea of putting a picture of me, 18 years old, fresh-faced on the campus, and then I looked at the hair. <laughs> and I thought that maybe it'd be best if we just talked about the year. But we've obviously grown in enrollment. And our international student population has grown, just as I promised. And it was interesting that it wasn't until 1997 that students were able to, that to indicate multiracial as they shared with us their demographic information when they came to the university. Yet today, 261 indicate that. Um, I also, we'll get this right, came across some, uh, and it's important to note too that this year's freshman class was born in 1991. Does that make anyone else feel a bit old? OK. And as you came in this morning, you noted the Beloit mindset list, some of the things about students that came to, to college this, uh, this fall and some of the ways that they viewed the world in comparison to our own. So I came up with some general themes that I wanted to share with you today from my time on the campus as an instructor, an advisor, working with student organizations, an administrator, a volunteer teacher. And so we are going to take a look at how our generation is celebrated, connected, connected to parents, technology savvy, and stressed. So as we look at these, um, you might be aware of the 2000 book by Strauss and Howe, The Millennial Risings, The ne Next Great Generation. When they talked about millennials, they said that they would be born between 1982 and 2004. 
There's also a 2006 book called Generation Me. This is by Gene Twinge. And the rest of this title really got me. It's Generation Me, colon, why today's young Americans are more confident, assertive, entitled, and more miserable than ever before. I feel like there should be some kind of like dun, dun, dun after that title. And Generation Me was described as um, people born between 1970 and 1990. And as I was kind of thinking about this concept of celebrated, I thought back to the Strauss and Howe book, and he talked about a particular way of sort of identifying that this group was celebrated and prized by their parents. And he talked about the baby on board sign. And we don't see those much. I haven't lately. They're probably out there. But they talked about this was one way to say that things were changing in how parents viewed their students. On the Twinge book, she talks about apparel and students or um, children um, wearing shirts that call them daddy's little girl or little princess, and you might see those things around. Um, I noticed the bumper stickers about an honor student belonging to the owner of the car. This one particularly made me laugh. The previous owner had the honor student, not necessarily the current owner. For my nieces, when they participate in, uh, in their little club soccer, everyone gets a trophy. The winner, just the participant, the young man who sat on the side and just cried through the whole thing, everyone gets a trophy. And I think the fact that our students are celebrated is, is interesting. I think it's interesting for us then to work with them. And I'm wondering if it hasn't in some ways adjusted the scale of risk and reward, that as they're sitting in your classrooms, that they might have been protected and their opportunities to experience failure in small and safe kinds of ways and then to develop that resiliency hasn't necessarily been calibrated to the degree where they feel comfortable in your classroom. Rebecca Nathan, the anthropologist who enrolled in college and then wrote the book about her quote unquote freshman year, you might remember it, my freshman year, what a professor learned by becoming a student, talked about this and she applied it to being in the classroom and asking students about their reading. Let's break down the reading. And she would be greeted by crickets and tumbleweeds, is what I call it. You know that deafening silence where you imagine the tumbleweed with a little dust rolling behind it and the sound of crickets? And you wait and you wonder, and you practice all those great teaching techniques, the wait time, the prompting with the question again, and maybe you're not getting the results that you're looking for. But she decided, what if I reframe the question a bit and help them calibrate that risk and reward in a different kind of way? What if I said, how many of you thought X? OK, how many of you thought Y? So if you thought X, let's talk about it. And if you thought Y, let's talk about that. And when students realized they don't, weren't the only one who thought X or Y, then they felt more comfortable actually engaging in the conversation. So while our students may come celebrated, while the risk may not, um, the risk and reward structure may be a little off, maybe there are some ways that we can simply ask a question in a different way and create a safe environment for them to engage. Um, it's, no, it's really no surprise that our students are connected. Um, with over 350 million active users on Facebook, we know that our students are on Facebook. And depending on which day you read the Chronicle, you'll find out that their participation in Facebook actually hurts their GPA, or it has no difference on their GPA, or it might actually improve their GPA. Again, which study, which day you're reading the Chronicle. But Facebook is out there, and it's a reality. I'm hearing more and more students talk about other social networking in a more frequent kind of way, like Skype, talking about Skyping their family at home, or also Skyping friends who might be studying abroad for a semester. We're hearing a lot about Twitter. And MySpace, which I thought was really dead for the college age students, I hear more students talk about it if they're involved in music. If they're a musician and they want to share their music, this is the way they're doing it. Since I started working on this presentation, I've had five current college students ask to add me to LinkedIn, and all of them had talked to me about job searching for internships or full-time employment shortly before that. So I feel like our students are maybe approaching this in uh, LinkedIn as maybe that professional social networking, and they see the distinct difference between Facebook. We're um, kind of wondering about who might be using it. This shows, it's almost a year old now, who's on Facebook. I know the graphic's a bit difficult. Our 18 to 25 year olds, our college students, are 35% of the pie. But I want to ask you, which is the fastest growing age group of Facebook users? Any guesses? You're, you're very close, and I think they are growing. The fastest is actually my mom's um, age group, women 55 to 65, that little slice of the pie up here. And it's true, she's on Facebook. I had to um, take the profile picture for her. Um, but students do talk about friending their parents and grandparents. And then they also talk about adjusting their profiles, untagging photos, 
making adjustments to their electronic presence around job searches and friending their family. So I feel like they're getting it. You know, we're having those conversations with them about what they're putting out there for future employers and what you're seeing about them and how that affects your view of them as students. I really think that they're getting it. And this I loved because they say that students may migrate away from Facebook. They're feeling the pressure of more high school students joining and more parents and older generation joining. And they're feeling that squeeze where maybe Facebook isn't their space any longer. So if they decide they want to migrate, they have a lot of choices. And heaven forbid I have to learn another social networking tool to try to keep up with them. But also, I love Facebook's top status trends of 2009. So every year, they take the, um, the, uh, the status updates that you can list on your profile, and they take four word phrases, and they do an analysis to look for trends. And then they break those down to the top 15. Some that I found interesting, number six, movies. Which movie do you think was most listed in status updates? Twilight, you got it, absolutely Twilight. Even as some of the big summer blockbusters, Twilight still won the day. Number 13, Yard. I thought this was very interesting. Maybe hipsters, right? Our college students are out there doing yard work in their free time. Um, actually, the researcher said that the hipsters' parents are joining Facebook at a greater rate, and they're talking about what they're doing, which is sometimes yard work. So that appeared this year. And I think that speaks to the change in demographics. Number two. Now, technology folks, if you're in the room and you um, are monitoring what I Google at work, I will let you know that I Googled this, and I'm embarrassed to say I had no idea what it was till a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's important that you know. The F, I'll leave to your interpretation. The M and the L stand for my life. And then the researchers gave this little bit. There was a spike of using this. Um, well, let me give you a little more background. It's a way of expressing frustration, and it is mostly social networking. It used to only appear in text, and then it suddenly started showing up on Facebook. It had a spike around the first part of May, and the researchers for Facebook attributed that to final exams. So you had a part in this, final exams, and also the fact that around the country we're getting a lot of rain during that time. They said there was a lull during the summer months, but there tends to typically be a peak Mondays and Tuesdays of using this phrase for Facebook status updates. And I think this also might speak to one of those trends when I talk about our stress that our college students experience on the serious side of this. Um, we also know that our, well, and let me just say that when I'm on Facebook, I learn some interesting things about our students. I had a student who um, posted his grandmother's eulogy with a spoiler alert on Facebook. So I learned that the student's grandmother had passed away. I learned a whole lot about the grandmother. I, from a different generation, thought it was very unusual that he would post that on Facebook, something so intensely personal. But yet he felt comfortable, and that was his realm, to express his grief and to share that with his friends. So I wrote him a sympathy card, and I got one of the nicest thank you phone calls from that student for that sympathy card. And I would not have known about that death if I hadn't been on Facebook. Um, I find out things about students that help me reference pop culture to know what's hot and what they're interested in. I find things on Facebook that help me understand what they're thinking and what they're feeling. I find out about job searches and celebratory things to help congratulate the students. And I also find out about staffing issues in my own department on Facebook, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's an important source of information. And if you're not out there, I encourage you to. And then I'll talk a little bit in my conclusion about developing sort of a framework that can make it comfortable for you. We also know that students are connected to their parents, just for fun, um, if you would just kind of think about or jot down what percent of parents um, and mothers and fathers separate plan to communicate with their college student daily. This is a national survey asking parents of prospective students. How many of them, what percent plan to communicate with their college student at least daily? You might be surprised, 30% of mothers, 14% of fathers, were you about right on? You were higher? How does this actually relate to when you were a college student? Did you have daily communication with your parents? OK, OK. And when they ask in the same survey what parents were concerned about, extreme or great concern, these are the topics. And I think it's interesting because we're also concerned about these things for our students, their health and safety, bottom of the pyramid, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, how they're going to pay for school. I would wonder if from 2007 to 2009, if finances might have a different percentage. Um, but career planning, I'm sure parents everywhere don't want their, want their students to have jobs. They don't want them to move home to their basement. We want them to have jobs, too. 
that all makes sense. Um, also, what percentage, after the students are here, they go back and they ask parents of current college students, what percentage more or much more involved in their child's life at college than their own parents were with them? Go ahead and make your guesses. 75%. 75%. So I really think this trend is not going anywhere. Parents are going to continue to be involved. And I think for us, it's a challenge to resist the urge that when we get the phone call or the email to automatically reply with only FERPA and run in the other direction, but to come up with a means of bringing that parent and student into the conversation and helping that student develop that confidence to talk to you directly and to, to kind of find solutions to their own problems. Um, I wanted to talk about the tech savvy aspect. This is no surprise to you, but I thought you might appreciate this as teachers. I know when you see the middle statistic, you'll wonder why you can never get a technology classroom if there are 53 out there for you from which to choose. But there's just a difference in what's available to our students now from 1995 and in the early 2000s. And then their own ability to access computing technology resources right in their hand from their backpack or their back pocket and also the access to laptops. At the bottom is their assessment of how, and again, this is a national study from 2009, 45% said that most or all of their instructors use IT effectively in courses. So the same study asked them, well, how do you want to use IT in your learning? And they want multiple opportunities to use technology in learning. And here are the percentages for how they want to do that and some of the methods. And so looking at that list, how many of you are incorporating one or more of those technologies already in, in the classes that you teach? Yeah, that's great. And that's probably why you're here at this retreat, because you get it. Um, I also think this generation is incredibly global. They come to the campus, they tell us as prospective students that they expect to travel or study abroad. They expect it as part of their education. They look forward to it. Then the hesitation comes in about money. They bring international travel experience, which is really surprising to me. The number of students who will say, well, I went with my church group or my high school Spanish club or my parents travel internationally. Not all students have the means to do so, but several do. They say that they understand diversity, but... I'll go back to Rebecca Nathan's work. She, in her work, asks students, you know, she finds that in national studies that they will say that they um, understand diversity and that they have at least one friend from a different racial or ethnic group. They'll say that in response to surveys. She asked them in her own survey the very same question, and they would respond in affirmative, but she would ask a follow-up question and say, please name your closest friends. And then she would compare the names to the racial and ethnic identity of those students and she would find she'd have to move very far down the list before she found a student that was of a different racial or ethnic group from the student responding to the survey. So I've always had the sense that our students say they understand diversity because they've been, they've been hearing about diversity even since elementary school. They've been, been hearing about it and asking to think about it and going through programs, but I'm not sure that they really understand it yet. They may appear to be global, but I still feel like we have a lot of work to do to expose them to ideas and people who are different than themselves. I feel like our students are stressed. This fall, we launched a program called the Guide to Personal Success, where students would have the option to opt in to a mentoring program, to work with a K-State faculty or staff member, and they would meet at least a minimum of three times in the fall or two times in the spring to help transition our freshman students into the college environment. This was a quote from one of the K-State students who participated in that program when asked about the success of the fall semester. It struck me that this student is a full-time student, a full-time mother, and has two jobs. And I feel like she's not alone. That the responsibilities and roles of our students are ever expanded and oftentimes they don't present themselves. That as they're sitting in your classroom, you might know, not know that this student had all of those things with which she was trying to manage, that, that she might be trying to manage. And I feel like we have more than just this student who's feeling that same type of, of pressure and concern. So I feel like it's important that as instructors and staff members, we know the resources that are available to help students, that in addition to having all of these demands, they're also worried about how they're going to pay for school, about illnesses, about all the things that they have to, to manage. And financially, it's important to note that we have some differences in tuition. So just um, if you could give us your best guess for K-State tuition and fees for a main campus in-state undergraduate in 1993 and then in 2008. So 
So in 1993, an in-state student paid about $1,000, an out-of-state student paid a little over $3,000. And in 2008, it's over $3,000 for an in-state student and over $8,000 for an out-of-state student. So when I oftentimes default to um, seeing my college students and putting, sort of putting my own college student experience on them, I think about paying for school how I paid for school, at the cost that it was for me to attend school, not at the cost it was for them to attend school. And I, I don't oftentimes put that together when I look at them and the challenges that they're facing. So let's talk a little bit about college debt. So for college seniors who graduated in 1993, their average student loan debt was about $9,000. or $46% of them had debt. And so then for 2008, what would be your best guess for college student debt? So there's national data and then Kansas data, including all institution types, and then for Kansas four-year public. And again, this is for undergraduate students. So we know our students have some pressures in how they're going to pay for school, both currently, taking, while they're taking classes, taking care of the everyday needs, and also what they have for them in the future. But it's also helpful to know we have a very responsive student financial aid office. When I called Larry Mader, Larry Mader for this K-State information, he provided this comparing 1993 to today. The asterisk on the 70% is because of the recent economic conditions. He thinks when they run this data again that more than 70% of K-State students will receive financial aid because of the number of students who called in and had a parent, one or more in their family, who lost jobs and uh, needed to have their financial aid package adjusted. Other observations. Our students come alive after dark, and I'm not just talking about the partying, right? Because I think that's something that stays the same. I feel like that one of the things that stays the same is students come to college, that drinking is part of the college culture. We want to try to mediate that and give them things to make good decisions. Um, but I also think that they're studying. Look at the hours of our library, the hours of our rec center, when they're having student meetings. I have a student group who drags me out every Tuesday at 8.15. And I know they're not the only student group meeting because I see other students and advisors walking the campus at that time. They come alive after dark, and I think that's part of fitting everything in. They work more, they travel more, they want life on their own terms. They'll ask for more hours to work, but then I think it's interesting. I think they ask for more time off then to do all the things they want to have a very rich life. They want to contribute, but they're not worried about established systems. I had a student, an honor student, sit in my office and say he and his fraternity brother had been talking about life at K-State and student life in general, and they wanted to write articles, and they wanted to get their word out there. And I said, great, and I started talking about experimental design and, and doing all of the, the legwork to make sure they had you know, a, a, a nice research study and to get connected with faculty. And he said, no, I just want to write about what I think. And I thought, but there's a system, and you've got to know the system. And they're interested in majors around pop culture trends, and we can talk about those in greater detail um, over break or at some other time. Credit issues, it's harder for them to get credit, but some of them who do don't make great decisions about it. Then they're young professionals, and they're out there, and they're needing to have a credit card for their job, and they're having a hard time making that happen. Religion and spirituality are really important topics for our campus in particular, and I believe others around the country, both the exploration and the wanting to practice and share their faith with others. And then the application. I would like to make some humble suggestions, and these really are humble suggestions, that um, it's okay to become a student of your students, and it's not so much that you need to be exactly like them, to dress like them. Um, we've all heard the term helicopter parent. A researcher just recently um, kind of coined another phrase for parents, and they called them karaoke parents, the ones who want to look and sound just like their students in addition to hovering around. Um, I'm not asking you to do any of that, but I would like you to have that, that in interest, to see something and to maybe not automatically react in this way, but to say, hmm, I want to learn more. To talk about your observations in, in groups just like this, and to share your ideas, because there might be some simple techniques like adjusting a question that would avoid the crickets and tumbleweeds and create an opportunity for your students. I call it to pull back the curtain. I loved it when I was in the classroom and a faculty member would talk to me about how they fell in love with their discipline. It made me want to learn more about that discipline. I liked it when I was young and trying to figure out my way in the world like I still am today, but people would talk to me about how they made difficult decisions, that they would be okay with saying, you know what, this was a really difficult decision for these what, because of these, these reasons, and these were the ways that I sort of analyzed it, and this is how I came to my decision, and this is probably some of the consequences, because it opened up something that just seemed to be so easy for that faculty member, but to have them talk about the process made me understand they were human and helped me learn in their process. 
Develop a social networking philosophy just like you have a teaching philosophy. Come up with some parameters for what makes sense to you. My husband has one. He works at a middle school and high school. He doesn't friend anyone who's still a current student at his school. He just doesn't. They have to graduate before he'll friend them. I have certain guidelines about what I'll post and what I won't post, just as a means of, of reminding myself that my profile is public and students are part of my network. We'll have to come up with a means to channel parental involvement. We have a parents and family association that's very interested in working with you, staff members, of finding ways to inform parents, to let them know about the transition to college and help their students. We need to continue to promote multiculturalism, even though students tell us they don't feel like they need it, and refer, refer, refer. We have some great resources on the K-State campus. We want to be sure that you know about them and have access to those resources so you can do what you do best, and that is share and teach your discipline and we can do what we do best in student life, and that's to help students with some of those outside of the classroom factors that may impact their ability to learn. Um, with that, I want to offer an open invitation for us to talk more. Coffee at any time. It, my email address is just my last name, and I encourage you to come up with your own ideas. There's so much more that I could have shared about trends that are affecting our students now, and I know you have more, and I would love to learn from you and, and share those ideas with you. So today is going to be very exciting. I hope this helps inform our conversations that we have a great day of learning together. Thank you very much. Thank you.